Hello and thank you for joining us at the virtual RWA dinghy show. Now something that many people have been waiting for, Ian Walker, RWA Director of Racing, caught up with some of the biggest names in Olympic sailing. Hear from inspirational Rio 2016 NACRA 17 gold medalist Santiago Langer, London 2012 laser radial gold medalist Lily Zhu, 1984 Finn gold medalist and America's Cup star Russell Coots, and Olympic double gold medalist and America's Cup presenter, Shirley Robertson. Well, for this year's RYA Dinghy Show, I was asked if I could interview four of the people who I most respect in the sport of sailing. Well, join me now as I caught up with four absolute legends of the sport. Here's the time I spent with Shirley Robertson, Lily Zhu, Santiago Langer, and no less than Sir Russell Coots. You represented your country in your home Olympic Games in Beijing or in Qingdao, where the sailing was in 2008. What, what was that? Were you 19 then? Uh, something like that? Uh, yeah, um, I think it was very stressful. Uh, I wasn't prepared for the pressure at all. I would much prefer to have a foreign Olympics for my first or second one. And then if that can be my third Olympics, I think I will better mastering the pressure so it's one uncertainty about the olympics and the other is from the home expectations so adding all together i have countless sleepless light in the end when we racing it's all the mental toughness that matters that determine right. the final results whether you can perform on the pressure whether you can still sell well when you feel nervous so these are the invisible skills that we need to learn as well Interesting. So that's the key quality, you think, for being a top sailor. Exactly. But I now understand why you were so calm under pressure in London 2012 in that amazing medal race. T tell us tell us about that. Yeah, I would say the reason that I can win that uh, London Olympic Games is I have that extra on for uh, being tougher in my mental preparation because after Beijing I've learned oh that's how Olympic tastes like and I started to learn some sports psychology books and uh, apply those skills of meditation self-talk and uh, utilizing it into my everyday training as well as racing so uh, put it in a simple way in terms of how many times we can participate in the Olympics, probably it's once, twice, three times, and maximum six, seven times. And every time you go to it, because it's so few or so rare in our life, then we will, we're all human nature. We will feel nervous. That's very normal. But if we going through our mind hundreds of thousands of times, like see how you will perform in the Olympics, in your mind, and by that time when that actually happens, you feel under control, you feel very familiar with the scene. So I've meditated uh, numerous times about uh, being, so having lots of cameras and doing lots of uh, interviews, but at the same time, the moment the starting gun shot uh, started, then I can just focus on my racing 100%. Tell me, thinking back to Atlanta, what was it like finishing fourth? Did you think about giving up and, and how did you turn that around? And what advice would you give people maybe who've, who've been in adversity and, and, and had to turn something around or want to turn something around as you did? Well, that's a massive question, Ian. <laughs> um, you know, I can still close my eyes and remember what it was like finishing that last race in Atlanta. And it's still, I still well up when I think about it. I mean, it was devastating. And I guess, you know, with the perspective of, of real life, it was, you know, only a sailing race, but you put everything into it. And, you know, as you know, like your whole life is for that one thing. Um, and of course, afterwards I could, I could look back and actually I could, write down the mistakes that I'd made that had cost me a medal and I think when you get so close you, you don't want that to happen again and I remember one of the joys of doing the podcast is you get to speak to obviously other people about similar situations and I remember talking to Tom Slingsby about it and he said you should always fear the person that finished fourth in the games before and 
you know, he's right in a way because you have a, a real determination not to leave a stone uncovered, to do, you know, to do everything possible, to work harder than anyone else and, you know, not without a glimpse of complacency in what you're doing. And I think that is, looking back, that's quite dangerous. And did you think about giving up? Have you ever thought about giving up? Oh, yeah, in, in massively. I mean, I arrived back from Atlanta and I sat in my car at Gatwick Airport, it's raining, and the windscreen wipers were going, and I really didn't know what to do. And of course, you know, now I'm, you know, a bit older, that sounds a bit crazy, but it, it, at that time, it was so all consuming. And A, it was over, and often it's quite hard, even if you've been successful and the Olympics finish, it's quite a hard time. And B, I don't know, it was, it was so difficult to, to comprehend and deal with. And nobody know, nobody knew what to say to you or what to or, or how to move it forward. No one phoned up because it was awkward and and it was really I mean I remember that winter being really quite difficult. But um but I guess I felt I I, I had more to give, that I could do it better, and I knew how to do it better. And um and I really love, I mean, I still, you know, love being in a boat and, um, and I really love, I love the Europe. So, I, I mean, I, I felt I'd come close enough that it was worth, it was worth doing it properly. And thinking back to 2015, which must have been the lowest point, I imagine, when you were diagnosed with lung cancer. I mean, did you ever think that you were going to go back to professional sailing or racing in the Olympics again? I, I absolutely didn't know. I, I, you know, I didn't know the output, the outcome of, of my surgeries. So, uh, but, but I was very lucky to have the dream to get prepared for Rio. Uh, that made me, the, the, you know, the, the desire and, and, and the determination to change things around was so big that uh, I, you know, the, the, the illness was not a matter for me. For me, the biggest challenge was to recover quick enough to go to Rio in good shape but i didn't know even if if i was going to be able to sail again i didn't know yeah so arguably if the other way around sailing was what what motivated you to recover from the illness uh and so it was actually in many ways that's what gave you the the passion and the the belief and the desire you know to, to overcome those difficulties a hundred percent sailing is a great sport but basically along my life it teaches you to deal with uh, external factors. We all been winning a race and suddenly the wind dies and you have to accept it. Uh, and, and so I think it, along all my life, it, sailing teaches our personality and we know about, ex and you know, basically unfair external uh, factors. And secondly, the passion to get prepared for Rio was a big matter. And then also, I must say my family, my team, and my friends were a big part of it. Without the team I had, and we have my, without my sons, would have been impossible to, to do all what we did. Hence, hence the emotion in Rio when they swam across, <laughs> if I remember rightly, to your boat. Yes, yeah, and, uh, wonderful, yes. wonderful, yes. wonderful scenes. And so, what do you think? What quality, therefore, do you think is most important in a sailor? Well, we we've seen it in all the sports, and and, and now we've seen it in in. in sailing now looking at the america's cup you know I, I i think there are many personalities that can be successful and many strong bits of personality that you know you see ben the determination the killing instinct he has you know he drives with so much power is you would say okay this is it we have seen it every day now in the cup but i think to to find your own style and you find you know work on your strong points and your weak points is what makes a, a good athlete. You, you cannot copy anyone. Your own style and to know how you enjoy the game and what's your dream, what, what you want of yourself and find yourself is, is, is an important thing. You're one of a very small group of people who've won both an Olympic gold medal and the America's Cup, perhaps. Well, Ben Ainsley and Pete Burling maybe are two that I can think of, Blair Took. So I can think of four, maybe you can I, think of some buddy more. Melvin. Yeah, Buddy Melges, that's right. Um, so which one means more to you, the Olympic gold medal or holding, uh, holding the America's Cup above your head? Well, you know, I mean, as my sailing involved, I, I started off sailing single-handed boats. 
and you know so i had a lot you know a goal to go to the olympics the first off and and went to the olympics and and you know had had success there and but as things evolved i i enjoyed sailing in team environments more and more and moved into which fortunate new zealand was challenging for the america's cup and moved into the america's cup and enjoyed that so i guess uh as time moved on, I enjoyed the team environment more, and uh, you probably rate that as, as 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 the most fun times when you when you're with a, a great group of people, a, a great group of buddies that you get on well with, and and uh, you know, a, a racing you know in that competitive environment, but having a a lot of fun along the way. You can only achieve so much on your own. You need to you need to have good people around you all the time. We were very focused on team actually and even even i go back even uh, in my younger sailing um i always teamed up with friends to to, to go sailing um, and we used to share information a lot swap boats um, change equipment um, talk honestly about why we thought um, uh, you know certain things were working certain things work weren't and I think that was a great lesson. You know, uh, uh, if I was to say one thing to um, the approach of junior sailors today, it would be really get away from um, the secrecy of, of, of oh, okay, I, I might have this, might have discovered this feature on my mast or my sail that's, that's that's now going really well and giving me an advantage. Well, but it's it's there are there will, will be all sorts of information that uh, the others around you have. And if you can somehow figure out a way to pull that information and, and accelerate your learning curve, you, then then you would, uh, you know, you, you, you'll greatly enhance your, your, your ability to race well later and, um, you know, and also have a lot more fun along the way. I've got, I've got to ask you this question. It's completely unfair. Um, who do you think is going to win the Prada Cup final and who do you think is going to win the America's Cup? Well... We are, I've got to say to the viewer, we are recording this just before the Prada Cup final. So, I mean, I'm definitely not going to say who I think is going to win. But I would say if you're a British fan, it really has never been better in 170 years. It has never been better for the British fan. And, you know, and I, I, I go around to the Ineos space and I've just seen and felt the confidence grow as each, as each week has, has gone by. And um, in this period... You know, three weeks before the final, the boat's been in the shed a lot. There's been lots of upgrades done, and I, I don't know. You just sense there that they that they feel actually quite confident with with the way they're sailing. We can all see that, but also in the package they have. So um, it's not going to be easy. Definitely, uh, it's going to be a. I imagine it's going to be a real battle, the Prada Cup final, and then who knows after that. So it. It's great television, it's great drama. And as I say, the British fan really is, a, it really is a special time. I mean, Ian, I remember when you were here in 2003 as skipper of GBR Challenge, um, I was in the studio in London reporting on that. And, you know, and I wonder how weird it is for you really watching, watching this all happen in, in Auckland nearly 20 years on. Your, your main uh, focus at the moment is, of course, the Cell GP, and we're really excited here in England that, that the Cell GP uh, Grand Prix will be coming to Plymouth. I think it's in July, correct me if I'm wrong, the second or third weekend in July. Uh, tell us a bit more about the Cell GP, Russell, and, and what people can expect if they come to see it in Plymouth. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's more teams and more competitive teams. So now we've got eight teams racing. Um, I think... Uh, the addition of the New Zealanders in, in, into that mix is going to you know, add a lot of uh, you know, competition. So um, the teams have been working very hard to, to, to get ready for season two and, and, and make sure that they're competitive. And also um, the intro introduction of the new wing sail. So we have a modular wing that uh, is, uh, goes to just under 30 metres for light winds and, and can, by taking sections out, can be down to 18 metres for strong winds. So hopefully, even if we do get a bad weather window in, in Plymouth, we'll, we'll still be able to race. And, and uh, you know, I think that'll be exciting. Of course, with the smaller wings and stronger winds, 
um, the boats are going to be incredibly fast. So it wouldn't surprise me to see 53, 54 knots of, of boat speed. Wow. Um, I think Plym Plymouth Sound will feel pretty small at 53 knots. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly with, uh, you know, seven other, other teams on the water, um, these teams are going to, you know, I, I think uh, there'll be pretty, plenty of adrenaline and uh, action on during those races. So, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I think it's 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 going to be a yeah, intriguing season. Yeah. People can come and cheer on Ben and Giles, and actually not Giles. I need him for the Olympics, Russell. You can't have Giles for a while. <laughs> we need him. Uh, we need him in the Finn in Tokyo. But uh, certainly Ben uh, will be leading the British team in Plymouth. And the other thing I do remember from Cows with the Cell GP was the Inspire program. Uh, it might have been too windy for the Grand Prix boats, but uh, I do remember the little catamarans out and a lot of very happy kids. Uh, I also remember the impact that I had on the local community in Bermuda. Maybe you can share some of that. Is there maybe there's some lessons we can take from uh, some of the work you've done with those programs? Well, this is obviously a key part of you know what we do and and I think why we exist. And we're really all about growing the sport and making the sport more, you know, doing our part to make it more accessible to a much wider group of of people and sort of grow that. Um, grow that interest, grow that fan base. That's what we're trying to do by making the sport more, well, let's say consumable and, and understandable at a, at a, at a broad class level, but also um, more you know, connectable at a, at, a, at a junior level. And our ambition is to, to really expose this, the sport to a, to a much wider, wider group of um, uh, young kids and, and, and enable them to really experience it and, and then find pathways for, the, for them to actually um, join organizations to then um, uh, hopefully you know, continue with the sport and, and, and uh, enjoy it the way that we all have and, and, and have been fortunate enough to, to do through our youth. Moving on now, of course, we're all a little bit older. Um, I'd like to think we're a little bit wiser. Um, we're both parents. Uh, I know that uh, your kids sail. Uh, obviously, know, know them well as a family. Killian's a keen young sailor. I'm not, so, not sure about Annabelle, whether she still gets out on the water or not, but what's it like being a sailing parent? And have you got any advice for other sailing parents out there? Well, that's... I mean, I don't know if I'm an expert. You never know if you're an expert in parenting. We'll have to wait and see. But, uh, you know, my daughter doesn't really, she doesn't mind kind of splishing about in a boat, but that's not her bag. But my son loves sailing. And uh, I didn't, we didn't have an optimist. He, um, you know, we live on the Isle of Wight. His club was Gurnard. There's about four knots of tide and rocks. And I mean, it's as hard as it gets <laughs> at Gurnard. And it took him a little while to, I think, have have confidence that he was going to be all right. That actually, you know, he was a good enough sailor to handle the conditions there. And so I guess I just let him get on with it. And I always refused to help him rig um, the boat, or you know, he'd be like, "You're a mean mummy. Everybody else, <laughs> everyone else's parents are helping them de rig." And, I don't know. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be the mummy who was, you know, derigging the boat. And I want. I mean, the, one of the things I love about sailing is that it breeds, you know, independence and self reliance. And I felt he needed a bit of that um, to be a little less molly coddled. So I never ever did. <laughs> any of it's the it's the school of hard knocks, is it? Is that the Shirley Robertson uh, sailing parenting advice? I guess if he was really desperate. Also, things like, you know, his wetsuit and everything. Like, I never washed it. I just said, okay, if you want to do this, you, you've got to take care of your own stuff. <laughs> so yeah. uh, so I'm, that, I'm that kind of mummy. But, uh, and I also let him sail all kinds of things. He also, you know, he windsurfed a lot on holiday. And um, it actually, he now has... The passions come from him. It's not been me mm. driving around the country. Yeah, that's that's. Uh, I, I, there's some similar. I, it, it's really hard. Uh, you know, I'm I'm probably halfway house between where you're at and and the sort of the keen parent with with my own daughter. 
Um, I'm the same with you with the kit from day one. I'm not getting involved in your sailing kit. If you forget your boots, then you've got to sail with bare feet. And if you forget your wetsuit, then you're going to get cold. So I kind of don't get involved in any of that, but it's really hard once they start racing to not want to give them tips or if you, you know, help them get ready so they can launch on time. Uh, and I think that, you know, what you've done is, as you say, you will have, you, you, you know, Killian is doing it because he wants to do it and it's his 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 drive and he loves the sport and and it's not being forced upon him so uh, probably done a great job there but as you say who the hell knows we shall find out in 5 10 20 years time whether we've done a good job if you had a piece of advice for young sailors what would that piece of advice be uh, my advice for the young sailors would be to read as many books related to sailing as possible. So for my experience, when I was in China, I have no books about sailing at all. It was not until when I picked up sailing and when I traveled to England that I was amazed to see how many books we have about sailing. I just couldn't help indulge myself into those books. You are very lucky to be a native English English speaker, but probably sometimes sometimes you will take it for granted and not really cherish those you already have. But for me, if I'm an uh, outsider when I came to the UK, and I just feel wow, those so many pressures, knowledge or um, theories already being made by your previous generation of people, learn from them first. And that will help you make less mistakes and then and then add on some of your own adventure, like your own innovation. Uh, so that why that's one of the suggestions. Maybe it's a bit boring, but yeah, read lots of books. I guess that's the cheapest way to help you improve. I think uh, as we talk in the meeting, um, you know, uh, enjoy, really enjoy it's a wonderful sport for all your life. Uh, you know, you don't need to be the best in optimist to win a gold medal. You just want to enjoy and, and try to work hard. Then along your sailing career, just enjoy to work hard, enjoy the challenge, enjoy the effort. And, uh, and be, you know, uh, just try to be the best and find your own way. It's nothing to copy and nothing to just find yourself and, and fight for it. And uh, it's, a, it's an incredible sport because it's an opportunity to any personality, any type of setting and uh, any type, you know, it keep developing. So it gives you a lot of chances. A lot of people, of course, um, uh, I think, you know, focus on, on really, you know, uh, uh, quantity at, at a young age. And I, th I think, um, Focusing on the enjoyment, on having fun, on connecting with other sailors, um, building those friendships, and then you know moving through that youth uh, pathway to you know, evolve into if you if you do want to become a Olympic sailor and and so forth, evolve into that. I think is you know is 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 worth. I think just um, making sure that you enjoy the that those early years more than more than worrying too much about your race results. So don't get despondent on, on if you're not uh, having great results at a young age. You know, that will come in time. I, I think the important thing is just to develop the passion. Well, I think really plow your own furrow. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Be a sponge and you, you can learn from all kinds of different people about all different kinds of things. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to do an Olympic campaign, or you want to be on a Volvo, or you want to somehow get involved in the cup, you know, just ask people. Phone, phone up. You know, Ian Walker, if you want to, if you want to do a Volvo Ocean race, or or Giles Scott, if you want to know more about your tactics. And I think initially that would be my biggest advice. Don't be afraid to ask people, whoever they are. I mean, I know certainly when I'm asked. I'm always delighted to to help if I can and um, yeah so first of all do that I think also if you can if you can have other skills you know if you want to get into fast foiling boats it's really helpful to have a, a technical understanding that doesn't necessarily mean you know you need a PhD from wherever but you know to have a technical understanding of how those boats work um, would be really would be really useful and 
and fundamentally I think you have to enjoy it and there wasn't a day you know when I was training for the Olympics actually in any boat I've sailed there's not a day where I haven't actually really enjoyed it I've loved the training you know win or lose actually I've enjoyed the racing um I've always wanted to do more as you said you, know, you had to stop me training too hard and uh, and I'm still like that in a boat I really I really enjoyed the challenge of sailing how it's always different um and the, you know different boats and different people and I just soak soak all that in you know as a young female talented sailor grab every opportunity sail with good people in different boats and just you know keep keep learning keep chipping away now that was fantastic it was great to hear from such inspirational sailing legends remember to come back tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. when we'll be talking live to some of the Team GB sailors heading out to Tokyo this summer. Make sure you get your questions ready. Up next, we've got Simon Rao, British Sailing Team meteorologist, sharing his knowledge on how to use a forecast on the water.